Alright, hello. So we're back for the second part of our discussion of DC motors. And I believe this is the slide we left off on. And remember what we learned last time was that DC motors uh, produce mechanical motion, so typically rotary motion, because of the input of a steady DC current. So we have our, uh, our currents right here. Right. I'm doing sort of getting my, getting my purple pen here, coloring in the dot and the X. And uh, that's a current going around the loop uh, coming out of the screen on the right hand side and going into the screen here. This is the laser pointer thing in PowerPoint. Here we go. So uh, coming out over here on the right and going in on the left. And if you use the right hand rule that we discussed last time, so remember, Thumb is force, I is on the pointer finger, B, the magnetic field, is on the middle finger. So if you twist around, and so let's do the one on the right first, twist around so that your finger is pointed out towards you, so the pointer finger, that's current, and you've got your middle finger pointed to the right in the direction of the magnetic field, then your force right here will be upwards on that side of the loop. If you do exactly the same thing, current in the opposite direction, right, because it's coming out on this side, it's coming across, it's going back in that side, then going back into the board, you have a force the opposite direction. And so the net force on this loop of wire sitting in this magnetic field is zero, because we get the same amount of force here and here, because we have the same amount of current, we have the same intensity of magnetic field. However, uh, what this does produce is a torque. And that causes, change to my, go. That causes this whole thing to start twisting so that the rotor, this side heads this way, this side heads this way, and it should, if everything is going well, keep right on spinning. However, we have a problem because if we imagine, you know, playing the tape forward a little bit, okay? So take a moment in time where uh, this wire has rotated so that it's now right about here, okay? So that's what we're seeing right there on this right-hand side. And on the left-hand side of the coil, right, it's been rotating with that uh, torque. So we're rotating this way, and that's what we're seeing right here, okay, in the bottom right. If we again look at the directions of the forces according to our right-hand rule and the Lorentz force, well, what they turn out to be is that. That's a problem, right? Because uh, over here on the left, all right, so I'll put a circle around it. Over here on the left, we have a torque that tends to rotate the thing. Uh, what is that? Counterclockwise. There we go. Counterclockwise. And over here, we have a force that tends to rotate this thing the other way, clockwise, right? This is a problem. If you had this kind of motor at best, you'd expect it to kind of seesaw back and forth. It would not continue to rotate all in one direction. If you were driving a propeller or a fan blade or something with it, then uh, you'd just sort of wiggle back and forth and you wouldn't accomplish much. And so it is important, imperative, in fact, in a brushed DC motor of this type to make sure that you have a commutator. Remember commutators back from our generator days where we used a commutator to make sure that the electrical output of the generator always had the same polarity, right? It was always pushing current in the same direction. And it did that by kind of flipping the contacts every time you came in contact with another little piece of that copper commutator. So with the appropriate commutator, you get torque in the same direction, all 360 degrees of the rotation, and you're much happier. Okay? Now, how does it do that here? Well, it's effectively doing the same thing, except uh, in reverse. So here we are putting electricity onto the brushes. The brushes then conduct that to the commutator. And then as the commutator rotates, well, that means that one side of the loop will be connected to, say, the left-hand brush for half the turn, and then the left-hand side of the loop will be connected to the right-hand brush for the other 180 degrees of the turn. 
let's take a look at that. So remember uh, what our commutator looks like. That's our picture that we are borrowing from our generator days. And the actual commutator part is this bit right there. And this is the case where you have lots of independent loops. So you have many independent segments of, uh, of the commutator. Okay? But for our single loop, we just need a single split ring. So uh, sort of two of these sections, just one divider between them. So one section would take up 180 degrees of this whole commutator and uh, the other section would come up the other. So you'd sort of split it sort of like that. Okay. And so that's what we're looking at over here. We've got first, and I've colored this red, right? Um, here, let me switch to the laser pointer. This side right here, see that I've labeled it red. Imagine it's just sort of painted with red paint, this wire. Okay? It's just to remind us of what we had before. And we conduct electricity in there. Electricity flows down here, and we've got our uh, current right there indicated with that arrow. It comes around here, goes back in there, comes back to this brush and completes the circuit. Great. Okay. So say that's the, the position, that's the way that the current goes through the first 180 degrees of our rotation. Then at some point, all right, our brush is staying fixed. Eventually the blue is going to rotate around and it's going to come into contact with the other side. So imagine this one rotating around to there and this one rotating around to there. Right, the wires, not the brushes, right? Those are, the brushes are fixed. And so when you have that rotation, you're eventually gonna have a case where the blue painted one is now in contact with the red painted brush because those don't change and uh, vice versa for the other side. Now we can add it down here. Okay, and what that effectively does is notice that now the blue wire is the one with the current so going this way, so say, um, into the page in the last slide. And the red wire is the one now carrying current out of the page, okay? And what that does is it makes sure that the torque on this rotor is the same, all, 103, all 360 degrees of the rotation. And that's the magic that the commutator buys you when you're talking about a brushed DC motor. So as you might expect, uh, we don't have single loops in a DC motor. We have many, 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 many loops. Because if you have many, many, many currents, instead of just one current, you have like lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of things, right? Lots of, doing it crudely here, but you imagine having a bunch of wires all carrying this same current, the current going around and around and around. Well, each one of those segments of current feels that same Lorentz force, and so you get more force and thus more torque at this point in the rotation. And then in addition to that, if we look at the diagram down uh, here, here we go. If you have a whole bunch of independent loops, well, that has kind of the same effect as it did with the DC uh, generator. Remember the DC generator, we had a bunch of independent loops so we could stay right along the top of a little voltage versus time graph, okay? If you remember that. And we kept switching from coil to coil to coil to coil with this uh, multi-segmented commutator right here, okay? With each pair of segments uh, attaching to one of the sets of coils on the rotor. Well, here we're actually accomplishing a very similar thing. Uh, each loop, so say uh, this one and this one, would only be in contact with the commutator, or rather the, the brushes, at one time, right? So each, as this thing rotates, only one loop is getting current. And what you do is you set it up so that you have a situation where this set of loops right here is the one getting current at this moment, because they're the ones that are gonna develop the most torque. If say you've got force up there and force down there, you get a lot of torque. Whereas if you looked at this one with the offset sort of diagonal ones, well, if you imagine current going through the same ways, you have force up, you got force down. This does not develop as much torque. If you remember back to your physics 100 days, remember that you develop the most torque when the force is perpendicular to the lever arm, the axis of rotation. And here we're not perpendicular, right? We're off at you know 120 degrees or something there. And so you develop less torque. 
So the, the scheme is such that the brushes are in contact with the set of coils that are developing the most torque at that one moment. And then after a little while, after this one starts rotating, rotating up this way, well, then they come out of contact with the brushes, they lose their current, and the next set of coils, say, start getting current and developing the maximum torque. And so the equivalent graph, it's not voltage versus time, but if you made a graph of torque, Remember, torque is like this little tau symbol versus time. Instead of having sort of this bouncy thing, if you just had one single loop, what you instead get, let me change my color here, what you instead get is something that looks like it's kind of going from the top of one bump to the next. Okay, so you develop very constant, relatively constant torque as you switch from coil to coil to coil to coil to coil. Okay, so when we pick up next time, we'll talk about uh, this more complicated looking DC motor, and I will see you then.